Good evening. Welcome to Central News for Tuesday, the 20th of August. I'm Hilary Twistle. In today's news, the Tauranga local is to climb Mount Kilimanjaro at the end of the month to raise awareness and share her story of her experience with ovarian cancer alongside other survivors and supporters. After being diagnosed with a rare form of ovarian cancer at age 10, Tracy Pepper underwent experimental treatment to help find the cure for lesser advanced stages of the disease. Being the first patient to trial aggressive chemotherapy in 1985, she was not expected to survive. 20 years later, she now resides in Mount Monganui and says climbing Mount Kilimanjaro will be a once in a lifetime challenge in strength, courage and hope. First of all, this country is such an amazing place to be. And I think that if anybody has ever been told that there's no hope, you should always look for a second opinion because there's always hope. And when you, and when you feel like there's no hope left, get out there and go for a walk and enjoy the beautiful sea air. Collectively, New Zealand children undergo 100,000 cancer treatments and procedures each year. Many of these children are living in our regions of the Waikato and Bay of Plenty. Stars of Courage, a program run by the Child Cancer Foundation, hopes to see another 90 stars purchased for children diagnosed with cancer in the Waikato. Several Matamata clubs have funded a star for children living with cancer right here in Matamata. The Kiwanis Club was one of these organisations and they are hoping that the money raised will go back into helping the community and seeing positive change. Gary King of Matamata Kiwanis Club says they wanted to help those children in the community with cancer and believe this is a great way to do that. As we understand it, it's part of the Child Cancer Foundation. Um, the money goes to help individual children in our community. Um, we don't know who our money has gone to yet, um, but no doubt we'll hear in the future. Um, and as we do know that it's going to be used directly for that child. Uh, if there's other children that come under that need, we'll be very happy to help them as well. Now for our regions with Hamilton, your Wednesday will have cloud increasing, evening rain and northeasterly breezes. Your expected high is 15 and an overnight low of 8. Rain developing in the evening for your Tauranga with cloud increasing throughout the day and fresh northeasterlies. Your expected high is 16 and an overnight low of 10. Just ahead, the Chamber is encouraging you to have your say on local government. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. The business community are being encouraged to give feedback on what they think are ways that local government can be improved. The Tauranga Chamber of Commerce are holding a series of forums. I spoke with Anne to find out how you can get involved in having your say on the council. They are focus groups with our members, um, the chamber members or the business community and from that we'll gain some information about what they consider these local body elections mean to them, what kind of governance they're looking for. We've just run surveys through the business community and getting some really interesting results which will then inform the focus groups which then inform another survey that will run with all the potential candidates. So the information that we get from the surveys, the focus groups will then ask the candidates in a survey and it will also inform the questions that we ask at the mayoral forum and the candidates evening. So we're trying to gain, we're not just saying we think we know the answers, we're saying you the business community tell us what is important to you, what do you think and what do you want from local government. Why do you think it was important to run these? Um, I think it's really important. I think the change of the um, executive powers to the mayor, mayor will alter the way things are done in the future. I think uh, the city has had a long-term situation of cost, not investment, and so these local body elections are very important that the business community A, understands the importance of voting, and B, what that can mean. So you, you've always got to keep in touch with this. Do you think that people in business take enough interest in local government? Um, yes 
and no. So the ones that are interested are really interested and the ones that aren't just really don't care. They're just, particularly in the last three or four years, have just been getting on with business. And in fact, it's been often a survival. So local government is just that thing that sits over there and puts my rates up and appears to make it difficult to do business. That's as much as it means. But their ability to change that is often misunderstood. How can local government regulations affect the day-to-day -day running of a business? Well, in fact, local government affects the day-to-day -day running of business much more than central government because it's actually the things that they make their bylaws and the laws on that impact you locally tomorrow. So central government has a long process to change any kind of um, act or anything at all like that and that is usually a high overarching act. So if you're talking the RMA that's what sits above everything but how it's implicated is, is what local government has a large impact on. So when you think of it like that local government has a huge ability to impact on what you do tomorrow in your business or your backyard. Do you think that smaller businesses are affected more by government, local government regulations or big organisations or both. I think it's a mixture of both, frankly. You know, if you were to take the port and how that does business, it, it has a huge, what local government does, particularly around, for instance, the dredging of the harbour, that has a lot to do with a big business. And they, But it's very specific. And they often have within their teams people that are um, managing that process. If you took a smaller business, they don't have those people inside their teams. And it is but it, the things that happen in local government still impact those small businesses, but they are much less able to be in a position of advocating. So that's why they turn to places like the Chamber and hope that we're advocating for and on behalf of business and helping them, the smaller person, deal with it. So there is, a, again, it's that mixture of what really works for big business and what is working for smaller business. Does a city council's debt affect the business community? Um, not especially, no. I think they, uh, the, as individuals or ratepayers, they get concerned about it, but it doesn't impact. What it does impact is, is the way the city invests back into its city. So if the council are really concerned about debt and they're not thinking of investment, they won't be doing those things that might grow the city. They're much more about keeping the debt low. So it does impact, but that's as an individual more than as a specifically about a business. Do any of the businesses that you work with feel constricted by local government? Always. They would tell you if you ask them, they always feel constricted because they can't do what they want to do tomorrow. But Again, it's that system of working around it. If you're, for instance, if you're setting up a, a cafe or a hospitality business, there's a lot of compliance that you need to apply for and to get and to get it all sorted and how that... Now, if you're setting that business up, that feels like it's a constraint. It is set out to keep the general rather than the specific. But So if your question is, does business feel constrained? Individually, yes. Is it a good or a bad thing? I'm not really in a position to answer because it does, um, different businesses have different impacts. But the, yes, small business particularly feels constrained. Some say that, you know, councils need to cut the red tape in order for a city to thrive. Do you think there's an element of truth in that? Um, it depends what you call red tape. You know, what some people consider as red tape is protection for others. And I'm sounding a little bit like a government bureaucrat here, and trust me, I'm not. But it is, you know, so if you're setting up a business that might impact on your neighbour, your neighbour is looking to go, well, I don't want that to be the rubbish dump next door to me or the car um, processing or the metal processing yard. I want to have some protections. So what feels like constraints can sometimes be protections. So you've got to sort of look, weigh it all up and check which one is actually working the best. You can find out more about this event on their website, tauranga.org.nz. Just ahead, a rise in dishonesty crime. Welcome back. East Waikato Police have a new crime prevention team after a big increase in what is being referred to as dishonesty crimes. These offences accounted for 53% of crime in the Matamata Piako district last month. 
Senior Sergeant Rod Carpenter has moved from his sub-area management of Matamata Piako to the management of crime prevention for the entire East Waikato. I spoke with him to discuss these changes. Welcome to the show, Rod. So, so after being moved from managing just the Matamata Piako region, now you are managing the whole of the East Waikato. So what does your role involve now? So basically I'm the prevention manager for Eastern Waikato and above me is the area controller, so I don't manage everything. I just give the strategical and tactical sort of direction about how things are moving in policing. So I look for trends, patterns, uh, look for areas in which we can try and achieve uh, the prevention line, which is to stop crime and crash before it actually occurs. And one of those patterns that you're seeing is there's been an increase in dishonesty crime. Well, yeah, dishonesty has always been one of our our top levels of crime that we've been trying to, to combat, if you were. Uh, it's about 50 odd percent, some, it sort of goes between 49 and 53 percent of our business in, Eastern Waik in the whole of Waikato, basically. Eastern Waikato is actually doing really well in the Waikato. We've got uh, specific targets and performance objectives from police that we're trying to meet towards a 214, 215 year. 13% crime reduction is one of the figures that we're looking for and we are achieving that in the Eastern Waikato. So how does that compare to the rest of the country? Are we quite high up in dishonesty crime? No, it's pretty much on average. That's, that's, we're pretty good. It's, it's no worse or better. We're pretty average, to be honest. Uh, we have different types of dishonesty offending, which for us is, is mainly burglaries. Like in Matamata Piako, uh, normally there's a bit more uh, what we say is non-dwelling burglaries, which is the burglary centred around farm sheds or uh, businesses. And then when you get out towards Thames, Coromandel, Haraki, you're looking more towards the holiday homes that are, are getting burgled, that sort of scenario. So the dwelling burglaries, which is how it's classed for police, is a lot higher. So, yeah, we're, we're pretty much on par. I suppose that could actually cause a lot of prompts, uh, well, difficulty because people wouldn't actually know that they've been burgled until they go there the next time. Exactly. So you, you see spikes, like for us it's around the Christmas period. Christmas, um, that holiday period over at the beach is normally a time of high crime because add into the mix of a lot more people into the, into the beach area for crime, uh, for the Christmas time, and then on top of that, you've got alcohol fueled events. So there's always going to be a spike in crime there. So we're planning now for Christmas. We're planning some initiatives so that we can try and make it a crime-free period, and we just want to make people uh, enjoy the period while still being safe. Does that involve taking uh, like some police officers out of the smaller towns like Matamata because there wouldn't be as many people here and putting them into those kind of beach places? Yeah, that's something that we assess and that's what we usually do. Uh, usually we look at some road policing people maybe moving across. But for me at the moment I see our biggest risk area is in Matamata Piako is road policing, uh, especially the Kaimai. Uh, we've got about 5,000 trucks a day that come over the Kaimai, and that's a 24-7 event. Uh, and on top of that, we've got, you know, it's a height of dairy farming at the moment. Uh, we've also got inclement weather. Uh, you know, recently, a couple of weeks ago, we had a truck and a bus get blown off on the old Tiara Road because of the high winds. You know, so it's, uh, road policing is very much a focal point for us still, uh, and even more so probably. And so we're directing a lot of resourcing and a lot of our, our focus is towards making the roads safer. And so does that mean more police on the roads? Yes, that's one of the things. Uh, we're trying to direct um, like the Highway Patrol to spend a lot more time around State 29 and, and uh, on State 24. So we're trying to get them out towards south of Matamata uh, a lot more. So you can expect hopefully to see the police there and to be doing their role. Well, I travel over the Kaimais and I've noticed there's been a lot more cops on the road, so... <laughs> yeah, well, you know, usually if you see a cop car, you slow down. And if you slow down, it's going to be safer. Now, going back to dishonesty crime, what, what, is, what categorises dishonesty crime? Obviously burglary, but what else is in there? Uh, theft, shoplifting, um, and those are the three main ones. So we're mainly looking at the house burglaries, which is what we call dwellings, or the farm buildings or factories, which is non-dwellings, and then just your normal shopliftings and, and your thefts. So, and theft can be a, like uh, somebody having 
uh, something stolen out of their handbag to uh, copper that gets stolen from earthing cable straps for things along those lines. And, and that's a very much a growth risk for us in police. Uh, is the copper that's been stolen through second hand and, and uh, dealt with through second hand dealers. How do you deal with that? I mean, do you kind of try and infiltrate that underground market or? Uh, it's a new strategy that we're actually undertaking at the moment. Uh, we're trying to work with our partners through Bay of Plenty and Auckland to make sure that we have a consistent approach. Uh, we'll be looking at enforcement through second hand dealers. Uh, that they comply with the Second Hand Dealers and Pawnbrokers Act and so that they have to, they have certain obligations under the Act that they have to meet and we'll be ensuring that they meet them so that we can try and tighten up on the, on the controls of that side of the market and then we want to deal with some other possibilities that we can see some areas for advantage. So if someone is a victim of dishonesty crime, what should they do? Oh, call police, tell us. Uh, there's no sense in having a house burgled and not telling us. We need to know because then we can see where the trends are, where the problems are and try and do something about it. Uh, because in small places like Matamata, 80% uh, of our crimes is usually committed by 20% of our people that we know are committing offences. So, and it's crime science, which is something we're moving right into as well. So we, if we can see what's happening, we can see usually who the people are involved because of the trends and the patterns. We can try and do something about it to prevent the next series of crime. For information on Community Watch or to become a part of the new crime fighting initiative, visit the police website, police.gov.nz. Coming up next, the Greaton Library. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. Many local residents of Gretton are not happy with the council's decision to not go ahead with the planned upgrade of the library. I spoke with the president of Friends of Tauranga Libraries to find out what has happened. So what did Sir Bob Harvey do when he found out about the decision? What did Sir Bob Harvey do when he found out? He cleared his diary and he made himself available. He's coming down to speak to us on the 30th of August to a public meeting, and he will be speaking on why smart cities build libraries. How long have you been campaigning? Just a mere 20 years. Um, this library was first asked for a major upgrade 20 years ago. It has been in the annual plan and the 10-year plan since 2003, and every year it has been put off and put off and put off. What was originally agreed on? Originally agreed on, well, the latest one was on 22nd of April this year. The city councillors agreed with a seven to four vote for a 900 square metre, brand new, 900 square metre, I just said that, brand new, $3.2 million library built on this site facing the village square, which would be the last piece in the village complex. And on the 4th of June they said no, again it was a 7-4 vote, and the reason being libraries are no longer a priority of ours. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, the state of the library now? This library is way too small, it is too crowded, um, it's very difficult to work in, it is very difficult to use, trying to get two people through an aisle is difficult. We don't have all the services that any of the other libraries have. We don't have the homework service for the children. We don't have room for book groups and clubs. Um, we don't have room for um, computer classes, genealogy classes. The books on the shelves, we've only got 0.9 of a book per person in the catchment area. We're meant to have 2.6, so we're severely restricted. The north wall, the wall behind us, leaks badly. So it's a leaky building and that's in the children's area so when the children are in for their groups and it's been raining they all stand up with wet bums. You can smell it when you come in, it stinks of mould and mildew. It is just not suitable for the purpose any longer. With e-books and you know the technology nowadays, you know, is there still a place for a library in the community? The e-books and internet question actually makes libraries more necessary. Mo a lot of people are not able to get onto the internet anywhere but in their libraries. They do not have connections at home. A lot of people use the libraries to do job applications, research, 
projects, connect with their family, all sorts of things like that, send in their assignments to Varsity and things. Um, so they need those libraries for that. The librarians know how to go through all the, the searching and show them which are correct authorit authoritative um, items on the net, not the garbage that you can pick up. Research in America has just found out that children, um, primary school children, can't cope with the net. They don't have the life skills to cope with everything they find on the net. And they are now going back and saying that children need to have 80% of their research done in books because they cannot cope with the sheer magnitude of what's on the net. Ebooks is another interesting one. It's picking up the lost generation, the 8 to 25 year old readers, and they start off reading up to 16 to 24 novels on their e-readers and then they get hooked into libraries. And it's the same with a lot of adults who've stopped reading. They start to read on their e-readers or on their smartphones like I do. But then they get hooked back into libraries. And it seems to be a figure of about 30%, 70% they read, 30% of their novels after that on smartphones or their e-readers, but they also want the hard copy. So libraries are still very, very necessary in these days and librarians are still very necessary. Population wise, how many people is this library meant to cater for? This library caters for 45,000 people. It's the south end of Tauranga, basically from Bethlehem, 11th Avenue, Mangatapu, Welcome Bay, back right through to the Lakes, Pies Pa, Ohauiti, Oropi, even up to Tauriko and Lower Kaimais, it's a massive area. It is over one third of the population of Tauranga. But the floor space we've got here today is less than 10% of the floor space of the, of the libraries of Tauranga. Do you think uh, Greeton being that lower socioeconomic area, is, it needs more of that community centre? This this area has a fantastic community and this library has a fantastic feel about it and a fantastic number of users. It would have more users, but we do need that community hub. And the, the library level of service policy, which this council actually put in place, demands that libraries provide community hubs. There's no space for it. There's absolutely no space. And, and the community has been calling out for 20 years and they have done submissions and petitions and submissions and petitions and everything else. They've put their hearts on the line in verbal submissions. They want their library, their community centre, their, well not their centre, their community hub. They want their village square, their village design completed. What are you asking of candidates for this upcoming election? We are asking them to support the Greaton Library 900 and if they don't support it, we will be popping that on Facebook and advising people not to vote for those council candidates. And that includes the incumbents. You can like their Facebook page to join the fight for a new library. Greaton Library 900. That is the news for today. We really want you to be involved, so like us on Facebook. Let us know your views. If you have news including your own video and photos, go to our website and hit upload. Thanks for joining us. I will be back tomorrow night with more guests from in and around the regions. I'm Hilary Twistle. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.